Hey all, check it out. That is the new Mazda CX-30. And the question is, is that a luxury SUV for half the price you'd expect it to be? Well, in this video, we are going over the top 10 things you need to know about this new Mazda. But we're also gonna try to take it off-road because one of the top 10 on this list may surprise you. Let's start out with number 10. What is a CX-30? Well, the CX-30 is a compact crossover. And you're probably thinking Mazda already makes several small crossovers. You're absolutely right. The CX-3 and the CX-5. Now the CX-30 is bigger than the CX-3, but smaller than the CX-5. And if you see where I'm going with this, why isn't it called the CX-4? Well, Mazda says they already have a CX-4 in China, but it's a completely different car than this vehicle. So. For now, you have to deal with the fact that the Mazda lineup goes CX-3, 30, 5, and then the Top Dog 9. It is what it is. Mazda spent a lot of time and effort in designing the audio system on the CX-30. Let's begin with what it is. This top-end trim has a 12-speaker Bose audio, but Mazda says that they've positioned the speakers so that the line of sound travels directly to the ear. Now, what that means practically is that the tweeters are actually mounted on the A-pillar rather than on the dashboard, and the speakers from the doors have actually moved up into the cowl. Now, Mazda says that when you're blasting your crummy music, people on the outside of the car are not gonna be able to hear it as well. Let's see if that's true. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Producer Zach is primed inside the CX-30, about to blast some royalty-free disco. And I am outside of the car like a pedestrian would be if Zach was stopped at a stoplight with his obnoxious music. So let's see if we can hear it out here. All right, Zach, let's see what you got. Oh yeah! Wow, is that blasting? That's pretty good, actually. You know, I can still hear myself think. Let's see what it sounds like inside. Keep playing. You know what? It actually works pretty well. So where, where do we go when everything feels like it just stays the same? The Mazda CX-30 is based on the Mazda 3, which means it's pretty small, compact, and shares a lot of its underneath components with that compact car. But one thing that is far better compared to the Mazda 3 is in the rear. Let me show you. So of course it's significantly taller than the Mazda 3 it's based on, but one of the advantages of that is rearward visibility because as gorgeous as the Mazda 3 is in hatchback form, the rearward visibility is awful. This Mazda CX-30 has a nice large rear window and a fairly small C pillar here, which means that visibility all around is very good. All right, guys, I have probably my favorite person in the automotive industry oh here today. <laughs> Dave, can you introduce yourself? Tell us what you do. Uh, I'm Dave Coleman, and I do a lot of stuff at Mazda. I don't know if my title ever makes any sense. I got, I'm technically the manager of vehicle dynamics for North America. Tell me about the platform. Let's start from kind of the ground up. So it, you might not be surprised. This is a Mazda 3 platform. Okay. So it's 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 a Mazda 3 in the in the package that everybody wants to buy. Everyone wants a small SUV now. So we have to make an SUV version of a Mazda 3. Right, <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> so underneath, does it share a lot of components? I mean, how similar is the architecture? It shares the architecture. Um, a surprising number of the components that look the same are actually different. Okay. So for the large, higher ride height, for example, the control arm, same basic strut suspension, but the struts are longer. The control arms have the ball joint at a different angle, all kinds of stuff to accommodate the actual differences in the package size. So when we say it shares a platform, it's more, the crash structure, the way the car absorbs energy, the way that the suspension geometry is designed to work, all that stuff is the same. The, kind of the engineering behind it is the same. Right. But when you get to the parts, it's really hard to find common parts. The powertrain's all the same, except for the final drive. Um, but you'll find really when you get into the details, not as many parts cross over as you think. Next up on our list is the off-road capability of the CX-30. Now, of course, it's not a rock crawler. It's not gonna do the Rubicon Trail, but Mazda has actually incorporated an off-road button. If you push the off-road mode, what it does is it locks up the rear torque coupling from a start, and then as you start moving, it'll start to relax that and see if there's any slippage and reapply it if it needs to. 
Uh, and it also changes our traction control algorithm because our normal traction control algorithm is designed to maximize acceleration, right. uh, which means it'll let the tire spin and l bring the power down a little bit to kind of catch the car up to the tire. Um, and off-road, that doesn't work. Off-road, if we have a tire in the air, we need to grab that brake really hard and transfer torque across the axle to the other side. Um, if we did that on the street, then when you punch the, to turn in front of a truck or something, we'd grab that brake and stall you right in front of the truck. So we don't want that as our base algorithm. Off-road, put it in that mode, now we're grabbing the brake really hard and we don't reduce the torque because you're probably going up a steep hill. So we've got this nice little gully here and I'm gonna try it first with normal mode, so traction control on just like you normally would. And then I'm gonna engage the off-road traction control and try it again. We're gonna get up on two wheels here, so this is pretty extreme for this little car. So the first attempt here is just in normal mode, like you get in, start it and drive it around every day. So. Here we go across a little gully. And there we go, we're on two wheels. Wheels are spinning. But notice they took a lot of spinning before the traction control actually engaged and clamped down on the brake. Now let's see what happens when we engage that special off-road program. Put it in the off-road traction control program. And just same thing. Let me see if I can get it. Oh yeah. So you can actually hear it clunk. So when you're in the off-road mode, it really grabs on the brake forces torque to the wheel with traction, and off we go. Pretty impressive stuff. That's obviously not a serious off-roader right. still, but the <laughs> idea here is we want you to be able to go wherever you want to go. Um, if you want to go to a trailhead that's at the end of some long dirt road and there's a couple of uneven spots along the way. We don't want you to have to give up and walk the rest of the way. Right. It should be able to get you there if you just use the off-road mode. So here's the thing about the Mazda CX-30. They say it competes with vehicles like the Subaru Crosstrek and even the Jeep Renegade, both of which have some off-road capability. So we've got a wee bit of a trail here. Yes, it's got a lot of cladding to make it look tough and rugged, but let's be honest, it's neither really tough nor all that rugged uh, when the going gets super tricky if you need to get to, <laughs> if you need to get to that start of the trailhead along a forest road or a little bit of a dirt road i think as we're proving right now the little cx30 is up to the task which i am pretty pleased with six speed automatic transmission no low range but even still the car is light enough where it just kind of pokes along no problem it's it's not a samurai but it's a little bit like the uh, Suzuki SX4, do you remember that? And when I put it in off-road mode, it actually allows the best possible all-wheel drive programming to begin with, so I'm not struggling with getting the all-wheel drive system to hook up after it spins and spins and spins, slips and then grips. So the Mazda 3 now is available in all-wheel drive, as is a CX-30. Yeah. Talk to me about some of the differences between the two, because if this is similar to a Mazda 3 underneath, is the all-wheel drive programming similar? The, the basic all-wheel drive programming is very similar. Um, the, the Mazda 3 doesn't have the off-road mode because okay. it doesn't have the ground clearance to go to the places where you would need it. Right. Right. <laughs> so, um, and we actually use that button location for, the, uh, for a button that can turn the stability control off. Whereas mm -hmm. on SUVs, we never actually turn it completely off. Um, that sort of a, a line in the sand that we draw between cars and SUVs. So you can see as the cars and SUVs get closer to each other, maybe that's not an obvious line, but right. um, that, that's, that's sort of the, our logic to which ones have that mode and which ones don't. At number six is the infotainment screen. It's an 8.8 .8 inch screen and journalists in the automotive community tend to really dislike this screen. Ah, but Mazda has come back and said that it's actually very intuitive to use. It just takes about three weeks on average for people to get used to it. And, and here's why. It looks like it should be a touch screen, but it's not. It's actually controlled by this little rotary dial down here. And Mazda says this is all to eliminate distraction. It's better to have tactile buttons and knobs to keep your eyes on the road, even if it is harder to use. Now, this is all in pursuit of something called glance time, which is the amount of time it takes for me to look from the road to the infotainment and back to the road. You wanna minimize that. Now, I have the formula written down to calculate glance time, and it's actually well, if we're being honest, very simple. Glance time is equal to 3.48 theta squared plus 4.06 theta squared times 10 to the negative fifth plus 
0.16. So what does that mean for me? I'm driving down the road, want to change the radio station. All right, changed. H how long was that? Plug that into the formula, please. <sighs> Next up on our list is Mazda's approach toward driver's assistance, which is not overbearing. For example, lane keep does not pogo you back and forth to keep you dead in the middle of the road. So let me give you an example. There's actually a bicycle coming up, and I'm gonna go ahead and cross over the center just a little bit to safely pass the bicycle. And look at that, it actually lets me go over the line just a little bit. It doesn't force me back into the center, so I'm not fighting the lane keep assist. You know, lane keep assist systems are usually just looking at the line markers and trying to keep you from crossing over the line. And if you, you look at just what the system is called, it's, you know, lane departure prevention. Well, we must prevent departing that lane. We kind of step back and look at the big picture of what might be going on there and realize that there's a lot of times where people need to get across that line or nudge up against that line for a legitimate reason. Say, for example, there's a bicycle in your lane and you want to give them a little space and go around them. We don't want a system that's going to then shove you back into the bicycle, right? Even if it just does a, a little bit, it's going to make you really uh, uncomfortable and think that, that the system's putting you at risk. So we limit how much torque that system can deliver to a small enough value that it's easy for the driver to overcome it. You can nudge up against the system and feel that it's fighting you and just sort of hold against it and go past what you need to go past. Uh, and so we actually will let the, the car drift and hit the line and come back over sometimes because we want it to stay out of your way as much as possible. You cannot do lane centering without completely ruining the steering feedback. And if you ruin the steering feedback, the car no longer feels natural. It no longer does any of the stuff that we're trying to do about making the car feel like it's an extension of your body. You're constantly wondering what this little tug at the wheel is, if it's something from the road, or if it's something from the car, you're not getting the, the, the feedback and the connection that we're after. Number four are the seats in the CX-30. Mazda spent a lot of time modeling the interior after human dynamics. Let me give you an example. So when humans are standing, we typically stand, believe it or not, upright. Well, I'm a bad example, but we don't walk around like this, right, with a curved back, which is how a lot of people sit. So Mazda tried to emulate this standing posture with that nice curve in your back when you sit down in this vehicle. Let me show you what I mean. So the idea is, is that when I sit, the seat promotes good posture. It's got a nice little bow here in the lumbar support, and they have included a lumbar adjustment, Mazda says, for that little extra fine tuning. But the actual seat design is meant to keep you in place. Another example of that is right here. It has thigh support, so you can lift and lower the thigh, and a nice short cushion here. Mazda, once again, says that's all to keep you in that standing upright position. Now, I appreciate that we have power seats on the driver's side and even memory seats, but on the passenger side, yeah, there's no power seats whatsoever. At number two here, we have the engine, and the CX-30 is a world car, which means they sell it in several different countries, but here in the US, we only have one engine and one transmission option. It's a 2.5 liter four-cylinder, inline four-cylinder, of course, transversely mounted, and it delivers 186 horsepower and 186 pound-feet of torque with 13 to one compression, even on 87 octane, which is pretty cool. Now, some things you need to know about this engine. Well, you can get it with cylinder deactivation, but only in the top end model. And there's only one transmission, like I mentioned, which is a conventional six-speed automatic. This is virtually the same engine you'd find in the current Mazda 3, and virtually the same engine you'd find in the previous generation Mazda 3. There are two of us in the car, flatbed of road. Let's see what the zero to 60 is, sport mode, and just floor it. And off we go, you time at home. There's 30, 40, 50, 55, and 60 there. Super impromptu, but the engine just doesn't have a lot of get up and go. And in the higher RPMs, it's a little bit buzzy. The interior of the CX-30 is also fairly similar to the Mazda 3, which is a absolutely brilliant thing because this, in my opinion, is just as good as about any Lexus interior. The design is incredible. It's all very driver centric. There's soft touch materials on absolutely everything. Mazda even spent a tremendous amount of time refining the buttons and switches. So there's a soft touch and then a metallic click very satisfying to use. But on the interior, there are several things that are kind of quirky and funny that you may not expect. The center console here is quite brilliantly designed because to open it, I can't simply pull up. I actually have to move the whole thing back 
and then pivot it up. And Mazda has done this so that you get the most access possible to things in the center console. But one of my favorite touches is if I move it up just a little bit, it locks in place and there's a little shelf here which is perfect for a smartphone. One of the stranger button layouts is actually here in the climate control system because several of these buttons are labeled. You have AC, you have fan speed up and down, power on and off for the climate, but you also have these two blank buttons, but they're not actually blank. You touch them and they control where the air goes or they re control recirc, but they have no physical label on them. That's pretty quirky. The steering wheel design here is one of the best in the industry. Really small airbag and elegant buttons here, but I love how they work because not only can they go up and down, you can actually push in on them and they have different functions depending on what you hit. Love that touch. Another interesting feature is actually here on the dashboard because Mazda has gone with an interesting color palette, brown on black. Now this, according to my mom, since I was the age of 13, is a big faux pas with dress shoes, but actually, I think she may have been wrong, because I kind of dig the brown on black. It's an interesting two-tone look. And the number one cool thing about the Mazda CX-30 is, well, the design. This is one stunning looking crossover, the best in segment by far in my opinion. Now what does Mazda say this vehicle competes with? Well they're targeting cars like the Subaru Crosstrek, Honda HRV, and even on the high end, the Lexus UX. And I think the back especially is one of the best looking crossover rear ends of all time. Let me start with these tail lights. Now these tail lights have these really cool light signatures. This outer ring lights up when you hit the brakes. The inner dot there is a turn signal. And I really think this round part looks like something off of a Ferrari FF. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. But the front is beautiful, the side is simple and elegant, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous car. And with a starting price of just under $22,000, it's a lot of good looks for not a lot of money. As swoopy and gorgeous as the design on the CX-30 is, there is one part that just drives me up the wall and I'm not sure why this is. It could be a clearance issue, it could be just a fundamental design thing that they couldn't form, but if you look down here, you can actually see there's a pretty big overlap between the front fender and the front door, because the front door makes this gentle curve up where the fender kind of just juts out, and it leaves this kind of obnoxious point. What do you think in the comment section below? Now it could be because this is a pre-production model, but the other CX-30s here on the trip also have this issue. The Mazda CX-30 is available in dealerships starting right now, and the version you see behind me is the top spec premium, which starts at just over $29,000. Now, if you want to see more about this brand new Mazda CX-30, head over to tflcar.com. We have several write-ups about this vehicle's engine and its overall design and layout. But as always, thank you so much for watching. My name is Tommy, and we'll see you guys on the next review.